The Holy Spirit spoke to me in that instant and gave me a verse. It had never happened before where the Lord actually gave me, the Holy Spirit actually revealed a verse from Scripture, an obscure one that I'd never heard of before. And the, the Holy Spirit said, Isaiah 19, 16. And I thought, oh, I'm glad I didn't take her to the bathroom or I would have missed this moment with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, so, so then I flip over quickly to Isaiah 19, 16, and this is what it says. It says, and in that day, Egypt will be like women and be afraid. And immediately I knew what the Lord was saying. That's not the context of that verse, but the Holy Spirit wanted to point something out to me that I was an absolute doofus and that I wasn't having empathy and understanding as to why my wife wouldn't want to walk down a dark path in the middle of the night. And so for me, it was an, an epiphanic moment and I realized, I gotta go help her right now. I knew what God was trying to say to me. Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. So today I'm beginning a brand new sermon series campaign called Spirit 360, Living in the Spirit, Learning to Live in the Spirit. So today in the first message of Spirit 360, it's uh, in, entitled Living La Vita Espiritu. And if you know a little bit of Spanish, you know that Espiritu is, is, is Spanish for spirit. And of course, I'm borrowing the title from Ricky Martin, right? Living La Vita Loca, which is living the crazy life, and we are to be living the spirit life. So we're going to be looking at what that means. What does it mean to live in the spirit? What does it mean to live by the spirit? When we look at the early church, we recognize something goes very, very quickly. The first thing to go in the church, and this is true throughout 2,000 years of church history, is reliance on the Holy Spirit. We see it with churches. We see it with denominations. You actually see it with the very first church in the New Testament. And it was the church of Galatia. And Paul writes them, and this is what he says to them. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Are you so foolish that you have begun in the Spirit and you will be perfected in the flesh? He was rebuking. Those are pretty harsh words, telling them they're bewitched and telling them they're fools because they lost their reliance on the Holy Spirit. And so that's the first thing that goes in denominations and to churches. And we have this need for the reliance on the Holy Spirit. What is it? What is the thing about the Holy Spirit? I think, we, I think some of us are afraid of being under the influence of this great Holy Spirit. And I don't know why. We don't seem to have any problem with being under the influence of other spirits. <laughs> have, you, have you noticed? I mean, all kinds of different spirits that people are under, and they kind of enjoy their addictions, don't they? So today I have only two points. You're going to be very excited. Two single points. And my two points are this. Here we go. Number one, the Holy Spirit is a person. Number two, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So the first thing is this, and we need to get our heads around this, it's fundamental, is that we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a concept. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force. Jesus never turned to his disciples and said, use the force, Luke. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, didn't say that. And what he does is he refers to the Holy Spirit as a person. Now, when I say a person, I'm talking about a divine person, not a human person. I think you understand that. And part of our challenge is this. When it comes to understanding the nature of God, we understand God as a person. We understand Jesus as a person. We're not so sure about the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you why we do that. We know what God looks like. He has a big, long, white beard. We know what Jesus looks like. He has a medium-length brown beard. What color beard does the Holy Spirit have? And so we, this, I'm not joking about this. We have an image of what God and Jesus look like. We can't imagine, we can't figure out what the Holy Spirit looks like. So let's let Jesus define it for us or define him for us. And Jesus is very, very specific about this. So here we are, we're in John chapter 16. I want you to listen very carefully to some words in here, starting at verse 13. However, 
When he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Did you notice any words that popped up there? First of all, I think it would be fair to say pronouns actually do matter, right? (laughs) They, They matter. And what he does is he makes it very clear that the Holy Spirit is not it. He never calls him it. What did he call him? He. He says it repeatedly. He, 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 he. And he tells us the mission of the Holy Spirit. He says, it's the Holy Spirit's the one that's going to teach us. The Holy Spirit's going to show us things to come. The Holy Spirit's going to tell us and reveal us and guide us. Boy, we better figure out who the Holy Spirit is. Because the Holy Spirit is fundamental to our walk with Christ. Now, the big challenge... I've said we we have a hard time conceptualizing in our little tiny minds what the Holy Spirit is or or what he looks like. And so the first thing we have to do, and I'm going to drill down on this, is we actually have to figure out the Trinity. The, The Trinity is so important, and it's not an option for us as Christians. We have to accept the concept of the Trinity. Now, in case you're not familiar with that term, Trinity means that God is one God but three persons. Now, That doesn't make sense. How can one God be three persons? The term Trinity is not in Scripture. It's a theological term that comes from the compound word triunity, the triunity of God, declaring one God as as three persons. And so because of our limited understanding, it just doesn't seem to make sense how one God could actually be three persons and three persons could only be one God. But if you go into Scripture, the Trinity is clearly articulated right from the very first chapter of the whole Bible. Genesis chapter 1, it says, God said, let us make man in our image. Did you catch that? Let us make man in our image, plural. And so I know some people say, well, he was talking to and about the angels. He said to the angels, let us make man in our our image. You're not made in the image of the angels. I mean, look to your left, look to your right. Do you see any wings there? (laughs) <laughs> You're no angel, trust me, on a bunch of levels. <laughs> right? you, you got that. And so he's not talking about the angels. The angels aren't created in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. And so he says, let us make man in our image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's the first thing. That's right, right at the beginning. We go to the beginning of the New Testament. Interesting, the Bible introduces the Trinity again. First chapter of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. So we have Jesus. We know a little bit about Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's taken on human form. He's been born in the manger, etc., etc. When he's 30 years old, he's being baptized in the Jordan River. And he goes down into the river with John the Baptist, his cousin. When he comes back up, here's what happens. It said, when he came up out of the water, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the bodily form, in the form of a dove. And then a voice from heaven came, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, here's what I don't want you to miss. What we are seeing in this moment is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all manifesting at the same moment, simultaneously. And so this dispels the the thought of what they call modalism, that, that God actually is all the same, one of these things, and just it's a different mode for him. It's like a different hat. The God hat, the Son hat, the Holy Spirit hat, and he's like this actor switching hats and doing this little routine. But that's not what's happening here. We see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all manifesting at the same moment. And that, under, that idea of modalism, that God is one God and one person with different modes, that's actually a heresy called Sabellianism, which I'm not going to get into at the moment. And what we have is we have to somehow, whether we're comfortable with it or not, we have to conceptualize the fact that there is a trinity, there's three persons, one God, and one of those persons is the Holy Spirit. And there's always somebody that comes along and they oversimplify it for you. You've all heard this. They say, oh, I don't know why you don't understand the trinity. It's so simple. It's like an egg. You've got the shell. You've got the white. You've got the yolk. Three and one. Oh, the Trinity. Oh, nice. You just reduced the God of this universe, the creator of heaven and earth, to the morning special at Smitty's. <laughs> no, that's not going to work for me, and it shouldn't work for you. It's a lot more complex than that. 
One of the greatest thinkers, Christian thinkers of all time, was a man by the name of St. Augustine, wrote City of God and a bunch of other books. Incredible stuff, incredible insights. And one of the things he struggled with, as you and I probably do, is he struggled with the Trinity. And one day he was walking along the beach and he was puzzling in his mind. He was always thinking, 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 thinking. And he's going along the beach, thinking about the, the Trinity and trying to figure it out. And he sees this young boy, and the boy has, has, uh, has built this, dug this hole with a pail, and he's taking water from the ocean, and he's dumping it into the hole, and another pail, and dumping it into the hole. So he says to the little boy, he said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm putting the ocean in this hole. And in that moment, he realized something, that this had been his fundamental problem. What he was trying to do was take an infinite God and try to reduce him to the point where he could understand him in his little tiny finite mind. And you see, that's our challenge, because God is beyond everything we can see. He's beyond this universe, and he's so great and so difficult to comprehend, and yet we so desperately want to figure it out. So I don't think I can totally satisfy your desire to know exactly how God can be three persons in one, but I can do this. I can give you a little illustration that I find helpful that at least gets you on the path. So, so here's how I look at it. See, when we live in this four-dimensional universe. We have three spatial dimensions, length, width, and depth, and we have one time dimension. So length, width, depth, and time, the four dimensions of the universe. And so we, when we think in terms of what God is like, we have to kind of figure him out. He has to figure into, the, into those four dimensions. And the problem is, how do you fit God into those four dimensions? Because he lives outside those four dimensions. I mean, we know he lives outside of time. I've preached about that many times. That time began when he created the universe. The vector of time is something unique to us. God doesn't live in the vector of time. So what would happen, though? Maybe we would understand the Trinity if we added just one more dimension. Maybe the, what would happen if there was... A fifth dimension. Well, there is a fifth dimension. You've all seen the fifth dimension, <laughs> formed in 1966, let the sunshine in, and the age of Aquarius. That's not, of course, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fifth dimension is the spiritual realm. I mean, God and the angels don't live in our four dimensions. They live in this other realm. So if you added just one more dimension, maybe this idea of God as three persons in one God would all make sense. So, so here, here's, here's where I'm going with this. When you take geometric shapes, for example, and you go from one, what, 3D to, to 2D to 3D to 4D, everything changes. So let me, let me show you. Let's take a square, for example. So we take the square, and in, in two dimensions, it's just a square. You add one dimension, uh, you go to three dimensions, and the square now becomes the cube. So we all understand that. And apparently, this is theoretical, that if you go to the fourth dimension of space, you get the tesseract. You all know what the tesseract is, don't you? You all watch the Avengers movie, Marvel Universe, right? It's got superpowers. And that's supposed to be, this is some mathematician's idea of what the fourth dimension looks like. We don't know that if that's what the fourth dimension looks like. We have no way of knowing that. They said, well, I know, but if you see it in motion, you can understand. So then they rotate it. All right, now that's supposed to prove to me that uh, it's a different dimension. That just still looks like 3D to me. But you, but you get my point. Every time you add a dimension, our perception changes, right? When we go from a square to a cube, big, big shift, right? Right or wrong? Track with me here, people, track with me, okay. So here's, here's my question. Can a circle be a triangle, and can a triangle be a circle? Look at this. Can a circle be a triangle? Can a triangle be a circle? In the two-dimensional space, the answer is no. They are completely different. But in three dimensions, you add one more dimension, and all of a sudden, you realize that a circle and a triangle can be the same thing because it's actually a cone. It's neither a circle or a triangle. So what would happen? Here's my point. What would happen if we added just one more dimension? Now, God probably lives outside of all the dimensions, but what would happen if you just added one more dimension? Then my suspicion is what would happen is all of a sudden, the one God in three people would totally make sense. Here's what my promise to you is, and you can take me, go to the bank on this one. When you get to heaven, you're going to walk through those pearly gates, and all of a sudden, in an instant, you're going to understand how God can be one God in three persons. And you're going to go, 
<laughs> of course. This was so simple. Why didn't I see that before? Just like when someone explains a riddle to you, and you go, no, oh, it's so obvious. And when you get to heaven, you're going to leave the confines of the, this dimensionality and enter into God's dimensionality, and all of a sudden it becomes clear. Now, the most important thing I'm saying here, whether you can buy that or not, here's the most important thing to remember, is that the Holy Spirit is a person. And if you understand the Trinity, or at least understand the concept, then you can understand that he is a person, and if he is a person, then you can determine how to relate to him. All right? So here's where I'm going. Here it is. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. You'll see the Trinity in this verse. Listen carefully. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. So what we saw there was the God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And it told us it's the grace of Jesus, it's the love of God, and it is the communion with the Holy Spirit, or at least that's what we're supposed to have. So let me explain my prayer life to you. This is how it works. I complain to God. Do you know why? Because he loves me. And he's not going to stop. So I complain to God. But I call out to Jesus for help because he gives me grace. He's my mediator. He's the one who stands in the gap. I know he's going to help me. So I don't complain to Jesus. I complain to God because he loves me and he's not going to stop loving me. But Jesus, oh, I call out to him because I need his help. And then what I do is I learn how to commune with the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the hard part for people. People don't, generally Christians, have trouble communing with the Holy Spirit. It means to have fellowship. It means to have relationship. It means to have friendship with the Holy Spirit. We understand our friend, what a friend I have in Jesus. We have a hard time understanding what a friend we have in the Holy Spirit. But the Scripture specifically says that we are to commune with him. Why? Because Jesus told us he will teach us all things, tell us all things, guide us all things. He's going to reveal all things to us. He's the key. He's the one we need to have this communication with. And if we don't learn to commune with the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be lost in space. So let me just give you one little embarrassing personal story to help you with this. So here it is. When Kathy and I first got married, we were brand new Christians, and uh, we kind of got married and became Christians kind of all at the same time, and we were enjoying this new life as a Christian couple together, and there was a lot of things that I didn't understand as a man and as a new Christian, so I'm just going to, you know, throw that out as a proviso in the beginning. So we, it was a summer, the first summer after we'd been married. We were staying in this cabin, this back cabin. It had no plumbing. We, had, we were getting into bed, and we were all cozy, and I had the covers pulled up, and I had my Bible out, and I was reading the Bible, because I'm a, the most spiritual guy you'll ever meet in your life. So I'm sitting there reading, and then, and then the bathroom was actually not in that building. It was in the next building down a dark path in the woods. So Kathy says, I need to go use the bathroom. I said, okay, bye. And she said, no, no, I, I want you to come with me. I said, well, I'm good. I don't need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and she said, no, that's not my point. I want you to walk me down the path. I said, why would you want me to walk you down the path? You just go down the path. There's no bears there. And uh, it's just down, just down the path there. You're good. I'm a real caveman. You understand this, right? I mean, I'm like this emotionally detached caveman who can't understand for the life of me. And I was all cozy. I was in bed. I didn't want to get out of bed and walk. And so we were having, I said, by the way, I'm reading the Bible. I'm like busy right now. Well, she was understandably a little bit miffed. She just wanted me to escort her down the path. And being a knuckle-headed caveman guy, I couldn't figure out why. So anyway, she got up. She w off she went out the door. She's not a chicken. And out she went down the door. And I thought, oh, that's, that's good. I didn't have to go. And so I'm reading, my, I'm reading the Bible, and this is what happened. The Holy Spirit spoke to me in that instant and gave me a verse. It had never happened before where the Lord actually gave me, the Holy Spirit actually revealed a verse from Scripture, an obscure one that I'd never heard of before. And the, the Holy Spirit said, Isaiah 19, 16. And I thought, oh, I'm glad I didn't take her to the bathroom or I would have missed this moment with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, so, so then I flip over quickly to Isaiah 19, 16, and this is what it says. It says, and in that day, Egypt will be like women and be afraid. And immediately I knew what the Lord was saying. That's not the context of that verse, but the Holy Spirit wanted to point something out to me that I was an absolute doofus and that I wasn't having empathy and understanding as to why my wife wouldn't want to walk down a dark path in the middle of the night. 
And so for me, it was an, an epiphanic moment, and I realized, I got to go help her right now. I knew what God was trying to say to me. So I closed the Bible, and I jumped in, and I ran out, the, out the, and started down the path. And because I'm very sensitive, I was calling out to her, Kathy, I'm coming, I'm right behind you. Where if it had been a guy, I would have snuck up behind her and gone, Whoa! and scared her to death. But the Holy Spirit was trying to save my marriage, not destroy it. And here's what, here's what I learned that that's what the Holy Spirit can do. We don't know things. We're not very bright. We're human, and especially if you're male. And the Holy Spirit can save your marriage, people. Just telling you. It's like the story of this guy. He goes, he's having trouble in their marriage, so the couple goes to this counselor, and the wife immediately starts complaining and says, my husband, he doesn't know how to communicate. We never talk. I don't even think he even knows anything about me. So the counselor turns to the husband and says, is that true? Do you even know what her favorite flower is? He said, of course I know that. It's Robin Hood, all purpose. <laughs> that's, that's, a true, that's a true story. That happened to me as well. <laughs> so the first thing here is this, is that the Holy Spirit is a person who wants to commune with you. The second thing is this, and you're going to love this. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. That's what Paul tells us. So, so you go into the epistles of Paul because it's his revelation, and he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit no longer dwells in temples made with hands, but the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And he says, The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and gives life to your mortal body. And he seems to be pounding home this one singular truth that the Holy Spirit, what? Dwells, dwells in you. He's making a big deal about it. And what is his excitement about this? Because if you look into the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit never, ever dwelt in a human. I can prove it to you. You go into the scripture and look it up. It says, and the Spirit came upon Samson, upon Samson, and he slew a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of donkey. And the Holy Spirit came upon Ezekiel, and he prophesied. Never once was the Holy Spirit dwelling in in people, he was coming upon them. So, question for you. Where did the Holy Spirit dwell in the Old Testament? Because Paul says, what? Temple made with hands. So where was, the, where was the Holy Spirit? He was in the temple. And more specifically, in what part of the temple? Who knows? In the Holy of Holies. Why would the Holy Spirit live in the Holy of Holies? Because he is the Holy Spirit. And it's the holiness, not only the power of God, it's the holiness of God. And he was protected by what? What was in the front of the Holy of Holies? Who remembers? The veil of the temple, this impassable veil. And if you wanted to, anytime you wanted to, you'd just go to the temple, just cruise through that veil and go hang out with the Holy Spirit, right? No, wrong. No, wrong. What, what, what was that, that veil for to keep you out? And only one person, only once a year, could go through that veil into the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. And only after the proper presentation and preparation, and if he didn't do that, he would be struck dead. And we know that because we've read the story about the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies. And what happened is the Philistines stole it, and King David got it back, and he was in his excitement. He was bringing it back to Jerusalem, and it, they put it on an ox cart, and it was rumbling down the road, and it hit a pothole, so it must have been in Winnipeg in the winter, and it hit a pothole, and it started to fall off of the cart, and Uzzah, one of David's captains, what did he do? He reached out and he steadied the ark, and what happened? He Boom! He was struck dead and fell to the ground. Now here's my question for you. Why did Uzzah have the temerity to touch the ark? I'll tell you why. He'd never seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. He, he doesn't know the stuff we know. We've seen the movie, right? We've seen the movie. We know what happens. I mean, Indiana Jones, he finds the ark. It's in the cave. And who's right behind him? The Nazis. And the next thing you know, he's tied up. Him and Marion are tied up on this pole. And the Nazis, they want to see what's inside the ark. You remember this? And so they said, let's have a pixie. Let's see. And so they go, and they're about to open this. But Indy has the presence of mind. He turns to Marion, and he says, don't look, don't look. See, he had read the Old Testament. Don't look, don't look. And so you, here's the picture. They're looking away. But the Nazis, oh, no, they wouldn't listen. And they opened up the ark. And then all of a sudden, he looks into the ark. And, ah, 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 he starts melting. My favorite scene in any movie. 
there's grosser pictures than this that I'm not going to show you for the children that might be in the room. Indiana Jones understood you don't mess with the ark. But I got news for you. That wouldn't happen in the New Testament. That's Old Testament stuff. You didn't touch, you didn't look at the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, something different happened. You say, how come we can have the Holy Spirit dwell in us? How is that? I'll tell you how that is. When Jesus died on the cross for our sin that he took away, it says he breathed his last and said it is finished and there was a great earthquake and what happened in the temple? Who remembers? The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has left the building made of hands and now dwells in you. That's what happened. And if you could find the Ark of the Covenant, and I know where it is, it's in a warehouse in Washington, it's fifth row back, third row up. You could grab that Ark of the Covenant and tuck it under your arm and you could walk along because the Holy Spirit already dwells in you, it's not in that box. And you see, why is this so important? Because if we understand that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we're not perfect, but we have been sanctified by his, his work on the cross, and therefore the Holy Spirit can now come and dwell in us. And that is one of the greatest and most incredible mysteries of all Scripture, that the Holy Spirit can actually dwell in you. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you... Uh, came to Christ as an adult, came to Christ as an adult. This illustration is going to be harder for those of you that were uh, Christians as children, but those of you holding up your hands, and I'm looking around the room, and, and you're good candidates, because most of you are rotten, stinking sinners when, when before Jesus found you. And, and here's, here's what happened. So after you came to Christ, and the Holy Spirit dwelt in you, did you notice things that you used to be able to do before you were in Christ and feel no guilt or compunction, all of a sudden you couldn't even do anymore? because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And I'm telling you, the answer to what ails the world, and the world's got a lot of problems today, is the Holy Spirit. But here's the good news, and this is where I'm finishing, is that God has not forgotten us. And what God has done throughout history is he invades, he sends out his spirit, and he sends his spirit into the human race again and again to reverse that moral entropy and for a restoration and you can see it peppered and d d marked all the way through history. We see it with the Reformation, and we see it with the Welsh Revival, and we see it with the, the Azusa Street Revival, and we see it with revivals all over history, the Great Awakenings, even in Canada with the Toronto Blessing a number of years ago. And every generation, because God has not forsaken us, every generation he will send his spirit anew, and he will restore and refresh the church, and he'll do it from the inside out. He will stir us up. And, 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 and at any time, at any time in history, you can go and find the Holy Spirit at work in a profound way somewhere in the world. So let me just end with this one final story. So on February 8, 2023, there's a seminary in Kentucky called Asbury Seminary. They've been in business since 1903, or 1905 rather, and they're a Wesleyan seminary. And on the 8th of February, that particular day, God came into the chapel meeting in an extraordinary way, and they knew that the Holy Spirit had descended upon that room, so they canceled all the classes, and they said, continue to worship and continue to pray, and the building remained open. It happened for 10 days. For 10 days, God was moving, and people started coming, young people from all over North America, and some people from all over the world to see what God was doing in that place. Here's the picture. Here's the auditorium. Incidentally, that auditorium is called the Hughes Auditorium. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> And it was packed for 10 days, day and night. And people came from all over, mostly Gen Z's, young people, having an encounter with God and being refreshed and being stirred up that this was their time and this was their season. And they were interviewing these people and I said, you traveled 2,000 miles. Why did you travel 2,000 miles to come to this? And they said, because I'm experiencing something here that I will never experience online. You see, that's what the church is all about. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. This is our day, people. This is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. In that day, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. He is coming. He is here. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and gives life to your mortal body. Let's stand together, shall we? If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. 
visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.